Many Christians today are sad. You may be one of them, but you know what? That is not the normal Christian life. Stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew will open the scripture and present for you the life-changing power of praise. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week, we're talking about the effect that praise has on the believer. And on our program yesterday, we kind of gave an introduction to this. And I tell you, it blessed me. It got me excited. Uh, it is a tremendous truth to recognize that God is a happy God. We were really messing with people's opinion of God yesterday on our program. And before I leave that, we're going to go on and talk about the effect that praise has on the believer. But my point was that praise is not optional. We showed out of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 47, 48, that praise or a lack of praise is one of the reasons that God brought judgment on the nation of Israel. Now, if God holds people accountable for a lack of praise, that shows you that he didn't consider it to be optional. It's something that God demanded. Now, under the New Covenant, God's not going to judge us or punish us for lack of praise, but it still means that we're missing out on the true nature of God if we aren't praising God and operating in joy and peace. And so we showed a lot of things on that, and we talked about the Scripture out of Hebrews 1, 9 that says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness above all of his fellows. So we were showing that God himself is a happy God, that the impression that some people have of God being an austere, mean, overbearing, uh, harsh God is inaccurate. That's not what the Scriptures picture. We were talking about that yesterday, and before I leave that point, let me just share this verse with you out of Zephaniah chapter 3. And in verse 17, it says, The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Man, that's a powerful scripture. And you know what? There's another translation. I think it's the Message Bible, and I don't have that in front of me. But in the Message Bible, I believe it is, it talks about that God will joy over thee with, I mean, dancing. He will twirl and with exuberance over here. I mean, the way that it's described in the original language is showing that God is just beside himself with joy over all of these things. Another passage of Scripture is in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. It says that we're supposed to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. You know, many people don't recognize this, but Jesus did go through sorrow in the garden. He, he was so grieved that he says that it, it was, he was nigh unto death, and he sweat as it was great drops of blood. And yes, that's true. And there was no sin or error in that. It was appropriate for him because he hated sin, and he did not want to be made sin. But the Scriptures also reveal that it was the joy set before him that enabled him to endure the cross. I guarantee you, if Jesus just would have thought about the physical suffering, the spiritual suffering, the exposure to sin, and if he would have been focused on only the negative side of his redemption, then I guarantee you it would have been unbearable. But the way he was able to deal with it, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, was he set the joy in front of him. It doesn't specify exactly what that was, but I believe that he saw triumph over the devil. He didn't only look at what it was going to cost him. He wasn't only looking at the price associated with it, but for the joy that was set before him. He saw himself triumphing over Satan. He saw himself rising from the dead. He saw the followers of just the joy that it would bring him. I believe that God, through his foreknowledge, was able to look down through history and see you and me and see the difference that His atonement would make in our life and the freedom that it would bring. The people that would be healed, the people that would be delivered, etc. And you know what? Because of that, that's what He motivated Himself by. And it's the same thing with you and I. We are not going to be able to endure if we don't set the joy in front of us and get, a, uh, get focused on these positive things that God has made. The Lord is rejoicing over us with joy. This is the nature and the character of God. It's the way that Jesus handled his oppression, and it's the way that you and I need to deal with the problems that come against us. You know, I remember when we were first getting started in ministry that my wife, as far as I know, it's the only time the Lord ever did this to her, but we used to sit around, and when we first got started, we met five nights a week, 
And we would worship the Lord up to an hour and a half, two hours, sometimes three hours at a time. Just worshiping the Lord. Praise and worship was, I mean, one of the dominant things of all of our gatherings. There were just little groups of 15, 20 people. And we would sit around and just worship the Lord. And one time as we were worshiping the Lord, the Lord opened up Jamie's eyes. And she literally saw angels in this old building that we were in. And they were twirling and dancing. And I mean, just rejoicing and having a time. And for a period of time, she wouldn't even share that with me because it was so contrary to the concept we had about God. You know, most people, if you would have come into that place that we were, it was an old, decrepit building. Matter of fact, we didn't even have enough money to have the heat on. Now, praise God it was in Texas, but you know what? Even in Texas, it gets cold sometimes. And I mean, there was times that it was down below freezing, and we were meeting in this old building with uh, tile floors, no heat in the thing, the thing, some of the windows were broken out. It was not a very nice building. It was just a storefront, downtown Seagoville, Texas. And you know what? People would have come in there and have looked at that, and they wouldn't have seen anything to rejoice over. They'd have seen just a small group of people, and I mean, we were struggling ourselves, and religious people would have come in there, and they would have seen all the negatives, and they would have said, boy, you aren't doing very much. You aren't making much of an impact. Who are you? Who are you to think that God Himself would rejoice over you? That He would joy over you? Yeah, so that's the typical attitude. Most of us, we just believe that God looks at all the negative things and focuses on those. And until we get taken care of every rotten thing in our life, that there, we aren't uh, causing any joy in God's heart. And yet that is not what this verse is saying. That's not what Jamie saw. And I don't believe it's the truth. You know what? God is a positive God. And sure, there's things wrong with you and me. Sure, we could be doing better. You know, there's times that I get through ministering and I think, and when I leave, I say, God, I could have done better than that. It's bigger than that on the inside of me. I'm not able to communicate and get across what I want to all of the time. And there's a tendency for me to look at that and because of that, never be satisfied, never rejoice, and never be thankful over anything. And yet the Lord has been teaching me that, no, you have to look at the positive side of it. I've never ministered as good as I could, but you know what? It is setting people free, and it is making an impact on people's lives, and I just have to focus on that. And that's the way that God is. God isn't looking at all of the things that are wrong with you. God's looking at the things that are right. God is rejoicing over you with joy, and you need to get this attitude. You need to recognize that God Himself is a happy God, that God is, is rejoicing. He is not discouraged, depressed, defeated. And if you are, then you aren't reflecting God properly to this world. I really believe that this is one reason that we don't have more people coming to church today because we've made our church services like funerals. They're dirges where we come and, man, nobody can have fun. I remember one time a friend of mine went to a church and they got so blessed and happy they raised their hands. And this was in a church that didn't raise their hands. And they were just praising God out loud. And an usher came up and tapped, tapped them on the shoulder and said, Hey, you can't do that in this church. And they said, Well, I can't help it. I'm just so full of joy. And this usher said, Well, you didn't get it here. <laughs> and you know what? That's true. It's sad to say, but most people, they go to church. They didn't get their joy there. I mean, if they got joy, it's in spite of what's going on in church. And that shouldn't be. If we were to reflect the joy of the Lord, and I mean really be praising God, you know what? I think we'd attract more people to the things of God. It should be that way. We're the, pe we're the only people that have a right to rejoice. But sad to say we've made religion this morbid thing where when you come in before God, you just got to get rid of all joy. You got to get rid of all rejoicing. You got to get serious. You Most people approach God crying and and feeling like if they don't feel unworthy and come before God, you know, beat down, that, that somehow or another this is irreverent to God. In Psalms 100, matter of fact, just let me read this passage to you because this will totally blow that attitude that we're describing right there. In Psalms 100, I'm getting there. It says in verse uh, 1, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that has made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is, is everlasting and His truth endureth 
to all generations. Did you know that if we really believe this scripture, then we would have to change the vast majority of our church services today. This is not the way. People do not make a joyful noise unto the Lord. They don't serve the Lord with gladness. They serve the Lord with sadness. They come before the Lord with complaining and, oh God, we're so unworthy. And yet this says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You know, it's easy for me to talk about what somebody else is doing, but let's just bring it down to us. Let me ask you this. When you come before the Lord, when you start into your prayer time, and hopefully you do spend time communicating with God, when you pray, how do you approach God? Do you really come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise? Are you thankful unto him? Do you bless his name? Or do you come in talking about how sorry you are and repenting for all of your sorriness? And are you focused more on your inadequacy than you are his adequacy? I think that probably a vast majority of people watching this broadcast would have to say that there's a lot of times that, man, your time with the Lord is wailing, travailing, and it is not according to this model given to us in Psalms 100. Brothers and sisters, that's one of the reasons that you don't enjoy being in the presence of God more is because we've made it something that is sad, it's oppressive, it's discouraging. You know, one time I just tried to be honest with the Lord and I, was, I said, God, I hate to admit this, but to tell you the truth, I, I hate the time I've set aside for prayer. I said, I actually go to dreading it. I had a time from 7 to 8 o'clock. And I said, about 6.30, I go to dreading it, thinking about it. And I was just confessing this to the Lord and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm, but that's the way it is. And you know what the Lord spoke to me? He says, don't worry about it. I go to dreading it about 6 o'clock. He says, it's terrible. <laughs> he says, it is so bad, the time that you just spend with me. And you know what? It shouldn't be that way. We ought to be rejoicing in the presence of God. We're going to take a break. We're going to tell you about how you can get some more of this teaching through our Bible college. We'll be right back. Now, before Andrew returns to complete today's teaching, don't miss your window of opportunity to attend Colorado Bible College. CBC offers one- and two-year courses of study. First-year students focus on intensive Bible study. Second-year students are presented with the needs for practical ministry around the world. They are mentored on the how-tos of applying the Word to every conceivable situation. And these classroom lessons are made alive through two exciting mission trips. But whether for a year of intensive Bible study or a second year of practical ministry, now is the time to call. Class sizes are strictly limited, so students must be enrolled on a first-come, first-served basis. Don't miss your window of opportunity to attend Colorado Bible College. Call or write for the current CBC catalog today. So we're talking about rejoicing in the presence of God and the effect that joy and praise will have on the believer. And I tell you, I know that many of you are listening to this and saying, well, boy, it sounds good, but... And then you start giving a list of all of the negative things that are happening in your life. And what you're doing is basically saying, well, I, I want to rejoice, but I can't rejoice with these negative things going on. Well, you know what? That's inaccurate. Let me share some more scripture on this with you out of John chapter 14. In, uh, well, let me turn over to John chapter 14, verse 1. Jesus said this. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You know, if you were to diagram that sentence the way that we used to do in school where you had to put in the subject and the verb and the, um, you know, object and all these kind of things, you would have to put down you as the understood subject of this sentence. In other words, you let not your heart be troubled. What I'm saying here is God said you don't let your heart be troubled. He's giving a command here. He didn't say this is a suggestion. This is a command. And if you would look at the context of this, it makes it even more powerful. Because this is Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before his crucifixion. He had already told them in just the previous verses that they were all going to be scattered. And Peter said, not me, Lord, I'll even die with you. And he says, Peter, the cock won't crow three times until you've denied... I mean, the cock won't crow in the morning until you've denied me three times. 
that you know me. The Lord knew what was going to happen. Had prophesied all of these negative things that were going to take place that very day. And then he turns around and in that context he says, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, most of us today would say this is unreasonable. God is saying, don't let your heart be troubled, and yet they're going to see Jesus betrayed. They're going to see Him beaten. They're going to see Him crucified, and yet they aren't supposed to be troubled over that. You know, if you'd read the Bible like it's real instead of just being some book that doesn't somehow or another pertain to reality, and if you would put yourself into this, the vast majority, probably 99 people out of 100 watching my television program right now, would say, this is unreasonable. These disciples should have been depressed. They should have been hurt. It should have broken their heart to see what was happening with Jesus. And yet Jesus is saying, don't let your heart be troubled. He goes on and repeats that in the 14th chapter. In the 16th chapter, verse 1, he says, These things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They should not have been offended. They shouldn't have been hurt. Most of us would say, well, that's unreasonable. Look what they went through. And then he ends up this whole discourse. This is all one discourse. It's all spoken. John 14, 15, and 16 were all spoken before Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. And he ends it up in verse uh, 33 of chapter 16 by saying, These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. And you know what? He wasn't talking about five years down the road, 20 years from now, something bad's going to happen. He was talking about in the next few hours, in the next few minutes. You are going to have problems, but he says, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Here's at least four or five references. The night before Jesus was crucified, him talking to his disciples saying, don't be troubled, don't be offended, be of good cheer in the midst of these terrible circumstances. Again, I say that most of you would think, well, this is unreasonable. You cannot do that. Well, I want to present to you that Jesus would have been unjust in giving us a command that we could not fulfill. This would be unjust for him to say, don't let your heart be troubled when you see me crucified, when you see me beaten. Don't let it even bother you. Don't let it offend you. And rejoice, be of good cheer, for I have, not am going to, but I have, past tense, already overcome the world. Most people would think that's unreasonable, but Jesus would not have told us to do those things if it wasn't possible. I'm presenting to you that joy in the midst of problems is not only possible, that is the normal Christian life. Now, it may not be normal what you see among your associates and by yourself, but you know what? It's normal Christianity. If the disciples would have really believed what Jesus had told them, they would have had cause to rejoice in the midst of this situation. Matter of fact, let me just back up into these same passages of Scripture. This is in John chapter 14. And in verse 28, Jesus said this, You have heard how I said I go, uh, said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. Again, if you read this in context, his going away is talking about that he was going to die. He was going to be taken from him, but he would come back through the resurrection of the dead. He says, if you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I go to the Father for my Father is greater than I. Now, here is Jesus saying that if you really loved me, you would rejoice during the time in between the crucifixion and the resurrection. He says, if you really loved me, you would rejoice. What a radical statement. And, you know, I've already taught on this. We taught a series about self-centeredness. And basically what the Lord is saying here is that if you were more concerned about me, if you loved me, if your attention was more on me than it was upon yourself, you would actually rejoice during the time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Now, there's two ways this could have happened. Number one, if they would have believed the prophecies, there were 14 times prior to this that Jesus had told his disciples, I will be crucified, but I will rise again. If they would have just believed the word of God, then they could have said, you know what, this is exactly what he prophesied. And if this is coming true, then this isn't the end of the story. Jesus is going to rise again. And they could have actually had joy and rejoicing, anticipating positive results. So that is one way that they could have rejoiced. But even if they didn't remember the resurrection, if they would have loved Jesus more than they loved themselves, they could have looked at it this way and have said, 
Well, even though Jesus is being crucified and it's terrible what's happening to him, at least he's escaping this world. And if there was ever a righteous person, if there was ever a person who was in relationship with God, it had to be Jesus. And even if they didn't believe he was the Messiah, they could have said, well, at least he's going to be recompensed now. He's going to be in the presence of God. The rebuke, the shame, the criticism, persecution will be over with. And they could have found reason to rejoice that finally Jesus was out of this life. But you know the reason that they were sorrowful? It was because they were focused on themselves and they were thinking, what am I going to do? Man, they did this to Jesus. It won't be long till they're coming after me. Look, we gave up everything. You can see this in the 24th chapter of the book of Luke that when two of his disciples were going to the road, on the road to Emmaus and they had heard reports about Jesus being crucified and then resurrected, they were still sad and Jesus came and walked with them Jesus began to commune with them and he says, what communications are these as you walk along and are sad? And they said, haven't you heard what has happened? And they talked about the resurrection of Jesus. They said, we've heard reports that he was raised from the dead. And besides all of this, we trusted that he was the one who should have redeemed Israel. And now what are we going to do? They showed you why they were really sad. They had heard reports of his resurrection, but really they were confused about what, where does this leave us? If he isn't the Messiah, we've given up our jobs. We've left our families. We've been kicked out of the church. We've been ostracized because of our association with him. What about us? See, that's the reason they were sad. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, you're sitting here, many of you are thinking, but look at my problems. But you know what? Really, if you were to look at things from God's perspective, you can rejoice. And I know some of you are thinking, but you, you don't know my problems. I've been told that I'm going to die. How can you rejoice? Well, Paul had such an attitude that over in Philippians chapter 1, he says, I am ready to die. He says, for me to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. It is better for me to go to be with the Lord. Matter of fact, he said, I'm in a strait between two. I have such a desire to depart and to be with the Lord that I really want to go, but I'm going to stay here because I know it's needful for you. Do you know, if you had your attitude correct, you could actually rejoice if the doctor told you you're going to die. One of two reasons. If you believe the Word of God, you can be healed. And then you're going to take this incurable disease that you're healed from and use the testimony to just rub the devil's nose in it and glorify God. Or if for some reason you never saw healing manifest. I believe it's God's will to always heal you, but you know we have a part to play in this. And if you never saw God's healing manifest in your life, well, then you still get to go be with the Lord. You know, if you look at it properly, you can't lose for winning. I mean, if you get healed, you win. If you die, you win. You go to the presence of the Lord. I mean, we sing these songs about, oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. Oh, God, I want to be with you. I want to be where you are. And we sing all of these songs. And then the doctor tells you you're going and you fall apart like a $2 suitcase. Something's wrong here. You know what? We could be praising God even in the midst of an incurable disease. If you're in poverty today and you're saying, but I can't praise God in a situation like this. Why not? I mean, if nothing else, you know, I believe once again, there's one of two ways that this is going to work out positively. If you take the word of God, it says he will supply all of your need. You'll get a great testimony out of it. You'll rub the devil's nose in it. It'll make you, it'll build up your faith and destroy Satan's kingdom by your testimony. And if you never saw that prosperity manifest, not because it's not God's will, but because we have a part to play with it. If you never saw God's healing man prosperity manifest in your life, well, then you could close your eyes and think about the streets of gold, that you're going to live in a mansion forever. You could still praise God because eternity is going to be awesome. This life is just like the snap of a finger compared to eternity. It's nothing compared to eternity. So it doesn't matter what situation you're in. If you're in a bad marriage and you're saying, how could I praise God in a bad marriage? Praise God that in heaven they don't marry nor are given in marriage. Praise God that it's only temporary. Praise God that, man, these problems you're experiencing aren't going to be forever, that you're going to live forever without marriage problems. You could start praising God over that. Brothers and sisters, there's no excuse for not praising God. There are reasons, but there are not excuses. God's supply is infinitely greater than your need. And so if you aren't praising God today, you just need to remove all of your excuses. You need to take this out of the realm of saying, well, I wished I could. Recognize that Jesus told his disciples the night before his crucifixion to rejoice, to let not their heart be troubled. 
to be of good cheer in the midst of that situation. If God could expect that of His disciples going through the crucifixion, certainly He expects you to be rejoicing through whatever situation you're in. I tell you, there's much more to share on that. Please take advantage of these materials that we're offering. Listen as our announcer gives out that information. And please take advantage of it. There's a three-tape series, a book. I promise you these things will go into more detail than what I'm able to here on the television. And it will be a blessing to you. And join me again tomorrow as we continue to talk about the effects of praise. Let us remind you that giving to support the Gospel Truth broadcast is a wonderful opportunity for you. You can share in the spiritual blessings of a ministry that focuses on the clear teaching of God's Word. And your donations make it possible for Gospel Truth to continue. And let us also remind you that Andrew's full three-tape audio album on the effects of praise or his book with the same title are both available for a donation of any amount to the work of this ministry. Enclose a check requesting tape series number T-1004 or book number T-309. Send it to Andrew Womack Ministries, P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs 80934. Or you can call us at 719-635-1111 to make a donation with Visa, MasterCard, or Discover. And we will be sure and send this teaching right out to you. And for those who are in financial crisis, Andrew is offering one tape from the series free of charge. We encourage you to make a donation no matter how small. But if you're unable at this time, please know this teaching is our ministry gift to you. Simply request tape number TW2 when you write or call. Earlier in our program, you saw a little promotion about our Bible colleges. And I just want to encourage you that I really believe God is doing something wonderful through these. I'm seeing people's lives change. If I wasn't in full-time ministry, I would go to our Bible schools. I really mean that. And I know that the Lord is speaking to some of you, so I just want to encourage you to follow through on this. We have our Bible college in uh, Coventry, England. We also have one here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And please call or write today and get the catalog or the prospectus about it and join us at our Bible college. And remember, when you support Andrew Womack Ministries, you're making an eternal investment in the lives of thousands of people you may never meet until you reach heaven. Whether it's our Bible colleges in Colorado, Russia, and England, or the teaching ministry going out daily through radio and TV, or the daily blessings and miracles channeled through the helpline, or another of the nearly three and a half million free teaching cassettes distributed to people in need, each day at Andrew Womack Ministries, we remember it's those who choose to support us who make it all possible. We ask you to prayerfully consider writing or calling today and sharing in this spiritual harvest and make it a point to join us each day, Monday through Friday at this same time, for more gospel truth with Andrew Womack.